He was the most feared man in Iraq. This guy was really a psychopath. And the greatest threat to the U.S. military. Zarqawi was so brutal in his methods, and at the same time so confident at what he did. Leaving a bloody trail of beheadings, bombings, and kidnappings, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was one of the world's most wanted terrorists. He had the same reward on his head as Osama bin Laden. And tested the skill and determination of the most elite warriors in the U.S. military. But in the end, Zarqawi would be brought down by his own hubris and betrayed by one of his own. June 7, 2006, 4.55 p.m. An American Special Forces team approaches an isolated farmhouse in eastern Iraq. Inside is one of the most dangerous men on earth, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq. For three years, the U.S. military has desperately tried to find Zarqawi. But he has proven to be amazingly elusive. Among jihadi circles inside of Iraq, uh, Zarqawi's reputation was just building and building and building, especially as every day went by when he wasn't captured. And he commanded a tremendous amount of respect because of his outsized reputation both for uh, being able to evade capture and for his willingness to literally get his hands dirty. With one of the most spectacular and violent terror sprees in history, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi has threatened to defeat the U.S. mission in Iraq. He is blamed for brutal murders of innocent hostages. He personally beheads American contractor Nick Berg and others. And he orders the bombing of Shiite mosques in an effort to provoke an all-out civil war. Not even school children are safe from Zarqawi's brand of terror. 35 die in a suicide car bombing as they are receiving candy from U.S. troops. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi will go down in history as a celebrity jihadi, a bloodthirsty psychopath who demonstrated that he would go to any lengths to sow chaos and dissension among the people of the earth. He killed anybody, any number of people, in any method, and specifically this the brutal way of killing, decapitation, mutilation, burning, hanging. But to Zarqawi, there is a method to the madness. Driven by a messianic ego, he is prepared to go to any extent to drive the U.S. from Iraq and unleash a sectarian war. Zarqawi, a follower of the Salafist movement, one of the most extreme forms of Sunni Islam loads anyone whose beliefs differ from his own, including all Shiite Muslims who he considers heretics. Zarqawi tries to sow chaos within Iraq by violently attacking Shiites. The civil bloodshed makes his capture one of the highest priorities for the U.S. in Iraq. Imagine the world our children would face if we allowed Zawahiri and Zarqawi and bin Laden and others of their ilk to seize power and operate with impunity out of Iraq. By June of 2006, killing Zarqawi is more than a mission for the U.S. It is an obsession. Zarqawi has become almost mythic for his ability to elude capture, but the noose has never been this tight. By June 7th, U.S. Special Forces have been tracking Sheikh Abdel Rahman, Zarqawi's spiritual advisor, for days. 
American intelligence has pieced together information from human sources, aerial reconnaissance, and electronic intercepts that tells them Rahman will be going to seize our Kawi this very night. They knew he was going to a meeting where they believed Zarqawi would be. They were following his every movement. U.S. aerial drones track Rahman as he pulls up to a safe house in eastern Iraq. Within five minutes, another vehicle arrives. It appears it is then that Rahman is told where he will meet Zarqawi. Rahman drives away, his destination a farmhouse in the small village of Hibhib, only 14 minutes away. He can have no way of knowing it, but he is sealing the doom of a man the United States has hunted frantically for three years. The hunt for Zarqawi is a story of bloodshed, betrayal, and above all, frustration. On more than one occasion, he is able to elude his pursuers when his capture or killing seemed certain. But those who know him early in life find his rise to terrorist mastermind baffling. As a child in Jordan, he plays soccer, does average in school, isn't even very religious. The only thing that stands out is his temper. Zarqawi uh, came from the town of Zarqa. He was known there as a street thug. He had been accused of rape. He had gone to prison for petty crimes. Uh, he really was a loser. Afghanistan, 1989. Zarqawi is in his mid-twenties and totally adrift. But like so many other young men in the Arab world, he will find cause in jihad, a holy war against godless infidels, a cause that already consumes Osama bin Laden. In 1989, he joins the resistance against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. But shortly after he arrives, the Soviets begin to pull out. Newsweek later reports that at this time, undaunted, Zarqawi embraces Islam and becomes a warrior against the communist-backed regime in Kabul. Armed with heavy caliber machine guns, he climbs mountains and shoots at communist troops in the valleys below. According to the Washington Post, by 1992, Zarqawi is a changed man, obsessed with fighting a religious crusade. He returns to Jordan and changes his name from Ahmed al-Kalela to Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, his nom de guerre. The name is taken from Zarqa, the poor Jordanian mining town, his home as a child. He then became involved in a plot against what he saw as an apostate regime, not living up to what Islam is supposed to live up to, and sought to overthrow uh, the Jordanian government. Zarqawi is quickly caught and spends seven years in a Jordanian prison. There he memorizes the Quran and develops a reputation for being both violent and ruthless. A Sunni Muslim, he also becomes known for his hatred of Shiites and anyone else who doesn't embrace his brand of Islam. A number of people have commented on his role in prison where the very power of his personality rather quickly established him as a leader. He would actually physically attack fellow prisoners who weren't studying the Quran. March 1999, Zarqawi is freed in a general amnesty for political prisoners. He soon travels back to Afghanistan and meets Osama bin Laden. Though he trains under bin Laden, Zarqawi decides to set up his own terrorist training camp, loosely affiliated with al-Qaeda. Zarqawi starts this training camp in Herat in the western Afghanistan and turns out to be incredibly successful at recruiting individuals from Lebanon and Syria. And soon he has developed this training camp into a camp of a thousand people or more. 
October 2001. In the aftermath of 9-11, the U.S. unleashes its assault on Afghanistan. Newsweek later reports Zarqawi is forced to flee to northern Iraq. There, he plots his first headline-making strike. In October of 2002, American diplomat Lawrence Foley is shot and killed in Amman, Jordan. A despicable act was committed that day, the assassination of an individual whose sole mission was to assist the people of Jordan. The captured assassin says his cell received money and weapons from Zakawi for that murder. Zarqawi is now on the U.S. radar and becomes part of the justification for war in Iraq. There is no conclusive evidence that Saddam Hussein ever supported Zarqawi. But Secretary of State Colin Powell claims that Zarqawi has been sheltered by the Iraqi regime. Powell also cites links between Zarqawi and bin Laden. According to a report in Newsweek, months before Powell's speech, U.S. intelligence has located Zarqawi's camp in Iraq and has a chance to take him out in an airstrike. But the attack is called off so that the Pentagon can concentrate on plans for the upcoming invasion. I'm told that the proposal to attack Zarqawi and his camp went to at least the deputy secretary level in the United States government, and a decision was made not to do it. March 2003, as Saddam falls, Zarqawi is now in central Iraq. There, he recruits fighters and starts his own jihadist group, the Unity and Holy War movement. And very quickly, he ignites the insurgency. By the summer, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi is able to establish a network and start planning some major attacks that really, from the beginning, set the tone for um, the American occupation. August 19th, 2003, Zarqawi masterminds his first major attack. A truck bomb parked outside the UN headquarters in Baghdad explodes, killing 22 people, including the UN Special Representative. The attack succeeds in virtually driving the UN out of Iraq and helps speed the country toward chaos. That was a brilliant strategic move on Zarqawi's part, because not only did he cause this horrendous bombing and killed a lot of people, the UN got out of there. He broke up this coalition. He broke up the rest of the world. He scared them away. By the end of 2003, the U.S. has made it a top priority to capture or kill Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. They quickly assemble a team of the military's best special ops soldiers for the hunt. Najaf, Iraq, August 29, 2003. Just as prayers are ending, a booby-trapped car explodes outside the Imam Ali Mosque. It kills about 80 people, including a top Shiite cleric. The Gold Dome Shrine, one of the holiest in Shiite Islam, is severely damaged. It is one of the first major attacks against Shiite civilians in Iraq and Abu Musab al-Zarqawi emerges as the likely suspect. It was his intent to set Muslim against Muslim. He wanted the Sunnis and the Shiites at war to make it impossible for the U.S. to seek a government that could take over and have a peaceful Iraq. He sought civil war. By 2004, the U.S. military has launched the hunt for Zarqawi, a secretive special operations team later known as Task Force 145 is created to track him down. The task force is composed of some of the most elite troops in the U.S. military, including the Army's Delta Force, the Navy's SEAL Team 6, and Army Rangers. 
The Defense News reports that these are some of the same soldiers that have just captured Saddam Hussein and killed his two sons. According to the Army Times, the commander of Task Force 145 is a Delta Force colonel whose identity, like his troops, remains a secret. With headquarters based in Balad, just north of Baghdad, Task Force 145 is divided up into four teams, each covering a different geographic region in Iraq. Task Force West is led by Navy SEAL Team 6, with Army Rangers in support. Task Force North is led by Rangers, with elements of Army's Delta Force. Task Force Central is led by Delta Force, with Rangers in support. And Task Force Black is British Special Ops. Uh, Task Force 145 uh, operates um, with a very, very direct chain of command, which gives them the authorities to do things that other organizations just don't have. When they see a target, when they have the intelligence, they can act on it quickly. January 2004, Zarqawi shows signs of feeling the heat. The U.S. military intercepts a letter from Zarqawi to Osama bin Laden in which he asks the Al-Qaeda leader to support his insurgency in Iraq. Zarqawi writes, Iraq has no mountains where we can take refuge or forests in whose thickets we can hide. Our backs are exposed and our movements compromised. Eyes are everywhere. Zarqawi is right. Task Force 145 is raiding suspected terrorist safe houses almost every night. They'll find maybe laptops, maybe cell phones. They'll interrogate anybody left alive. Whatever intelligence they can gain in that hour, they will use to drive another mission that night so that whoever they're hunting doesn't have the chance to realize that their buddies have just been taken down and they'd better get out of there. March 2nd, 2004. Suicide bombers blow themselves up in Karbala and Baghdad during a Shiite religious festival. The death toll tops 200. Iraq is inching closer to civil war. The US military knows they must stop Zarqawi and his army of insurgents. But the terror leader proves to be as elusive as he is deadly. He took very extreme security measures on everything that he did, from um, changing residence very often to changing out the methods and means by which he communicate with those within his organization. He understood that uh, he was a target by the coalition forces here in Iraq and that we were, we were hunting him. Across Iraq, the task force is rounding up suspected insurgents and building a trail of human intelligence that they hope will lead them to Zarqawi. In March of 2006, the New York Times reports that back in 2004, a special task force converted one of Saddam Hussein's former military bases into a top secret detention center. American soldiers reportedly beat prisoners with rifle butts in their efforts to extract information to help hunt down Zarqawi. But in response, the U.S. military says any kind of abuse is not consistent with the values of the Special Operations Command. Baghdad, April 10, 2004. 26-year-old American contractor Nicholas Berg disappears from his hotel in Baghdad. Four weeks later, a gruesome video surfaces on the internet. It shows a masked man reading a manifesto, then beheading Berg with a large knife. The assassin is identified 
as Zarqawi. When Abu Musa al Zarqawi uh, beheaded Nick Berg himself on videotape, it really showed how bloodthirsty he, uh, he was. This guy was really a psychopath and really struck fear in the hearts of not just the Iraqis on the ground there, but everyone who was operating in Iraq. The Special Task Force exploits any advantage it can to track Zarqawi down, using everything from high-tech surveillance drones to radio intercepts to human intelligence. Whenever possible, the commandos operate at night, using night vision and deploying helicopter pilots specially trained to fly at night. July 2004, almost a year after Zarqawi's first major attack, he is still on the loose. The US military decides to up the stakes by placing a $25 million bounty on his head. The same reward posted for the world's most wanted man, Osama bin Laden. He got more headlines than Osama bin Laden. He had the same reward on his head as Osama bin Laden. And it began to affect his ego. His ego seems to have been hugely inflated. And what's most interesting is how the US essentially tried to use that to its advantage. October 2004. Zarqawi's brutal killings of other Muslims generate controversy among fellow jihadists. To shore up his position as leader of the insurgency in Iraq, Zarqawi pledges his allegiance to bin Laden and changes the name of his terrorist organization to Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Bin Laden crowns Zarqawi Prince of Al-Qaeda, but the seemingly cozy relationship between bin Laden and Zarqawi will eventually show signs of strain. Fallujah, November 2004. U.S. forces launch an all-out assault on this Sunni Muslim stronghold to root out suspected insurgents. The military believes that Zarqawi had been hiding here. It's one of the bloodiest battles of the war. As the battle for Fallujah rages, the U.S. military makes the hunt for Zarqawi its top priority in Iraq. There are unconfirmed reports that Iraqi police unknowingly capture Zarqawi in a dragnet of suspected insurgents. He is held at the local police station for 30 minutes, then let go. His ability to evade capture, if anything, added to the myth of his heroic uh, stature. Uh, and he became almost godlike in his ability. And saying somehow to his true believers, Allah must be on his side. Zarqawi was an icon. He is that symbol who has fought the Americans. And he stood fast against the uh, foreign invaders. Zarqawi seems invincible. The frustrating near miss will be one of several in a three-year hunt for him. But each setback will ultimately bring Task Force 145 closer to nabbing their prey. February 20th, 2005. On a highway west of Baghdad, members of Task Force 145 are laying an ambush. According to their own intelligence sources, the man they've been hunting for two years, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, is about to drive through the area. The roadblocks are set. The soldiers are ready. And zero hour arrives. But Zarqawi does not. The frustrated soldiers start getting ready to leave. Suddenly, a vehicle comes racing down the highway. Inside are a driver and one passenger, Zarqawi. 
He bust through a Delta Force checkpoint, and then he was hurtling towards a Ranger checkpoint. The Ranger machine gunner uh, at that checkpoint had Zarqawi in his sights and asked for permission to open fire. A lieutenant orders the gunner to hold fire. He wants to be sure it really is Zarqawi. But as the vehicle speeds right by, they catch sight of him. The Rangers were uh, close enough to look him in the eye as, as he drove through. Task force vehicles immediately give chase. Zarqawi's car has a head start and slips out of view onto a dirt road. But the Rangers still know exactly where he is. An unmanned drone aircraft is tracking him from above. Then, disaster. Unfortunately, at that precise moment, the picture switched from being a very tight focus on the vehicle and on Zarqawi to being an extremely wide shot of the town itself. And by the time they had reset the picture, he disappeared. Zarqawi escapes on foot to the nearest town, leaving behind his driver, his laptop, and 100,000 euros in cash. I mean, this is so close. I mean, can you imagine how awful it was for those special operations forces that night to have just missed him? Adding to the Rangers' frustration is that Zarqawi's narrow escape helps boost his mythic standing in much of the Arab world as a man who, like bin Laden, can't be caught. It became very difficult for the U.S. forces to capture him because there was a lot of local support where he was operating. He was seen as a hero. He was seen as a liberator, as a savior, as the man that was going to liberate Iraq from his occupiers. Zarqawi becomes a master at using the Internet to further his cause. He cements his reputation for brutality by beheading another American hostage, Eugene Armstrong. He orders his fighters to videotape roadside bombs exploding on American convoys and broadcasts the grisly images. Zarqawi even turns the internet into a tool for raising money and recruiting suicide bombers. They are very sophisticated in using the internet, the television, the radio, uh, in, the, in a very intelligent, very clever way to manipulate the public opinion to their advantage. As Zarqawi's reputation and terror campaign reach new heights, so does Washington's desire to stop him. By 2005, Zarqawi is America's most wanted terrorist in Iraq. It became very urgent. Zarqawi was the person who created the most dramatic, the most spectacular attacks, the ones that got the headlines and made it impossible for the Bush administration to claim that there was progress in Iraq. That's why they pulled resources out of Afghanistan, away from the search for Midladen, and went after Zarqawi. But Zarqawi is planting the seeds of his own destruction. His brutal tactics are becoming too much even for some of his allies. People that we have detained that are members of Al-Qaeda in Iraq perhaps have grown tired of this relentless killing of innocent Iraqi civilians and realized that they thought they were coming to do one thing and then they found that 70% of what they really killed were just innocent women and children and young men. October 2005, the U.S. releases a letter it says it intercepted, sent to Zarqawi from Osama bin Laden's deputy, Ayman al-Zawahiri. The letter chides Zarqawi for hurting al-Qaeda's reputation through his videotaped beheadings and attacks on fellow Muslims. It says he should be concentrating on driving out American soldiers. Amman, Jordan, November 9th, 2005. Zarqawi attacks his native country, sending suicide bombers into three hotels in the capital. The blasts kill approximately 60 people and injure 150. 
including a Muslim wedding party. He saw this as a base for expanding and attacking modernizing Arab regimes who are not living up to the true faith, that they too are seen as enemies, as infidels. But the attacks backfire on Zarqawi. Outraged Jordanians stage mass protests. And according to Newsweek, Jordan's King Abdullah creates a special intelligence unit, the Knights of God, to try to infiltrate Zarqawi's inner circle. After all, it was Jordanians who made up the core of Zarqawi's group of his foreign fighters. And the Jordanian intelligence people were very skilled at getting to those people, figuring out who would know where he might be tomorrow at 4 o'clock or the next day at midnight. Zarqawi also makes new enemies within Iraq. The bombing of the revered Shiite mosque in Samarra in February 2006 helped spark further violence between rival Muslims, just as Zarqawi wishes. This touched off about two days of really frightening sectarian violence that brought the country, everyone agrees, to the verge of civil war in a way that it hadn't been before and perhaps hasn't been since. Even some of Zarqawi's own fighters are starting to question their attacks against innocent Iraqi civilians, seeing them as un-Islamic. By going too far, Zarqawi has opened a new window of opportunity for Task Force 145. Having dissension in Abu Musab al-Zarqawi's organization made it possible to infiltrate the organization. And um, without that opening, it would not have been possible to get inside and to take down the leader. This is exactly what the American task force needs. The pressure on them has never been greater because Iraq is threatening to tip into civil war. They step up their raids, up to as many as six a day, killing off dozens within Zarqawi's organization. His days seem numbered. By April 2006, Task Force 145 is credited with killing over 100 of Zarqawi's senior people. But their success comes at a price. More than six Task Force members have been killed, a significant loss to the unit, considering their unique skill and expertise. April 16, 2006, Yusufia, Iraq, a turning point for the Task Force. In a house raid that turns into a vicious firefight, the task force kills five terrorists, three of them wearing suicide belts, and captures five others for questioning. And inside, they discover something else, a videotape of Zarqawi himself boasting to the camera. The tape contains clues that will help lead the task force to their target. April 2006. It's been three years since Task Force 145 began the hunt for Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. To make matters worse, a new videotape comes to light, showing Zarqawi meeting with his followers and firing weapons in the desert. It seems like another frustration for the task force. But their luck is about to change. In the aftermath of a raid on a safe house in Yusufia, soldiers recover a raw videotape, and the footage that remains presents a somewhat less heroic picture of the terrorist leader. What the outtake show is that he has a hard time working the gun, doesn't quite know how to do it, and somebody else has to come and show him. He wasn't quite the you know, rebel freedom fighter that it was portrayed in the tape that we were given from the uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. The videotape does more than injures Arkawi's vanity. He will pay heavily for his attempt at self-promotion. As the tape becomes instrumental in the hunt, computer imaging isolates where it was shot. Then comes another breakthrough. Intelligence sources identify a key advisor to Zarqawi, Sheikh Abd al-Rahman, and the task force begins to monitor his movements and contacts. 
A special ops team locates and begins tracking the Sheikh through aerial drones and intercepts of his satellite phone calls. The hope is that Rahman will lead them straight to Zarqawi. This was such a solid connection to Zarqawi. They knew he was going to a meeting where they believed Zarqawi would be. They were following his every movement. Wednesday, June 7th, multiple sources report that U.S. intelligence determines that Zarqawi will be meeting with Rahman at a house in Hibhid, a small village 40 miles north of Baghdad. This time, military commanders want to be sure that the elusive terrorist doesn't get away. You can imagine these special operations forces sitting around thinking, please, 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 let this be true, let this be. I mean, and it is like a great detective story. According to US officials, at 4.18 p.m., Rahman is tracked to a house just outside Hibhib. There, it seems, Rahman is given the specific logistics. He is told of Zarqawi's exact location and that it is safe to meet with him. They came outside, got into another vehicle, and then moved to the uh, safe house, arriving there around 4.55 in the afternoon, on Thursday afternoon, and went into the safe house. Rahman and Zarqawi meet for about 45 minutes. While they meet, Members of Task Force 145 surround the small village of Hibhib. -Hib. Commanders discuss a frontal assault, but decide there won't be enough ground troops to ensure that Zarqawi doesn't escape again. The initial objective is to capture Zarqawi alive and interrogate him. But the clock is ticking. They felt like at any moment he could be leaving the house, and the um, the observers said, look, we've got to um, do something here. Uh, we might only have a few moments left where we know exactly where Abu Musab al-Zarqawi is. We realize this is a fleeting target. We have them there at this time, clearly in their safe house, and we need to attack it now. At 6.12 p.m., the decision is made to call in an airstrike. Two US F-16 pilots on routine patrol are given the coordinates of the safe house and are told simply that a high-value target is inside. Within moments, one of the F-16s drops a 500-pound GBU-12 bomb. It zeroes in on the target, which has been illuminated by a laser. If you look at the video, you'll see an L in the lower right-hand corner that's flashing, and that means that the laser is uh, illuminating the target. And you'll see the pilot is very careful about keeping those crosshairs exactly over the house because he knows that the bomb is going to hit right dead center of those crosshairs. 98 seconds later, the same jet drops another 500-pound bomb, this one guided by a satellite signal. Beneath the smoke, there is nothing left of the safe house but a pile of rubble and twisted metal. Five people, including Rahman, two women, and a child die in the intense explosions. Shockingly, Zarqawi is still alive. Hib Hib, Iraq, June 7, 2006, 6.17 p.m. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi is still alive after a U.S. jet drops two 500-pound bombs on his safe house. But not for long. 52 minutes after the airstrike, he succumbs to massive injuries. At 7.04 p.m., Zarqawi is pronounced dead. Zarqawi died of massive internal um, pressure on his chest that collapsed his lungs. In fact, when the medics first arrived on scene, he spewed up enough blood that uh, they could tell that he had a massive internal injuries and was in terminal at that point already. We have confirmed here at Abu Musab al-Zarqawi has been killed. Got a call from Baghdad confirming the Prince of Terror has been killed. The significance of this is, of course, awesome. It has been a lot more military activity, the choppers. A special forensics team arrives on the scene to identify his body. 
relying in part on the distinctive green tattoos he is known to have. After three bloody years, the hunt for Zarqawi is over. U.S. Special Forces immediately scour the ruins of the smoldering safe house, looking for clues that will lead them to more of Zarqawi's men. They find a cache of weapons and a treasure trove of intelligence, including a laptop, a computer drive, and other documents. Within days, American troops, including Task Force 145, carry out 140 raids near Baghdad, killing 32 insurgents and capturing 178 others. The killing of Zarqawi yielded an enormous wealth of intelligence, both in the safe house itself and in other safe houses that were hit at the same time. Clearly their intent is to roll up the organization before it can get back on its feet. The news of Zarqawi's death provides a much needed boost in morale for the task force, who pursued him tirelessly through three years of frustrating near misses and at the cost of several lives. We clearly have disrupted and disorganized that network. There is absolutely no question. Will they regenerate? Absolutely. They've proven to be very resilient over time, but they're not gonna be as effective or as organized or as capable as they were for a long time. Still, the task force that tracked down Zarqawi has no time to rest. Every day there is another mission, and each successful raid yields new intelligence that fuels yet more missions. The commandos called this cycle the unblinking eye. And in the words of the Army Times, the unblinking eye is still wide open. Baghdad, Iraq, June 12, 2006. An Islamic militant website releases a statement announcing that an Egyptian known as Abu Ayyub al-Masri will replace Zarqawi as the head of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Al-Masri has trained in an al-Qaeda camp in Afghanistan and was reportedly close to Zwahiri, bin Laden's number two. Experts believe his appointment is a sign that al-Qaeda is trying to unify the insurgency and return to primarily targeting the West. Having said that, since uh, the death of Zarqawi, the actions we have seen are very much continuing in the spirit of Zarqawi. June 30th, 2006, the U.S. posts a $5 million reward for any information leading to the capture of Zarqawi's successor. That same day, Osama bin Laden releases an audio tape paying tribute to Zarqawi, calling him a lion of jihad and praying that he will be accepted as a martyr. But just two days later, in an interview with the Italian newspaper La Repubblica, Zarqawi's first wife accuses bin Laden of selling out her husband because he had become too powerful. He was a student of bin Laden who wanted to become the professor. And uh, he swore his allegiance to bin Laden uh, publicly, but there was a great rivalry there. July 2nd, 2006, Iraqi and American officials confirm that Zarqawi has been buried in an undisclosed location in Baghdad. Although Zarqawi's reign of terror is over, the hatred and sectarian violence that he fueled continues. Tens of thousands of Iraqis been, must have been killed in the, by Zarqawi. But the most damaging thing, the most detrimental damage he has inflicted on Iraq is this crack or the fracture he has created in the national unity. He was trying so hard, using every possible method to trigger off the civil war. It will need few years to mend 
and to rebuild these bridges. Perhaps Sarkawi's ultimate legacy is that he was a new breed of terrorist, a bloodthirsty killer with a keen understanding of propaganda and the use of the internet. Zarqawi brought the jihad into the 21st century and showed that he was willing to kill fellow Muslims to achieve his objectives. That is his lasting legacy right now, fomenting sectarian violence. He started it, it is underway. You can't take that back. Whether they can put that back in the bag is what will determine Iraq's future. Daring television takes us places. It dares to take us there, in our minds. It dares us to go off the map, to the places we didn't know, we didn't know. It dares us to jump in, buckle up, and floor it. It dares us to turn things over, just to see what's underneath. It dares us to know. It dares us to go. Daring television takes us places. Are you ready? The National Geographic Channel. Dare to explore. It was a war fought in an ancient land against an unpredictable enemy. Full of risk, demanding a bold new military strategy, and deploying the world's most advanced weapons. Our military capabilities are so devastating and precise that we can destroy an Iraqi tank under a bridge without damaging the bridge. But would it work? Critics are coming out of the walls to criticize this ground campaign. The mission to topple a dictator and end his brutal 24-year rule. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. In this hour, we'll take you inside the Pentagon's military campaign and on the road for 21 days from Kuwait to Baghdad. Featuring eyewitness accounts from the Iraqi capital as shock and awe lets loose. It was extraordinary to see it. all of the trophies of the regime just going up in flames. And an intimate look at America's bravest men and women who put their lives on the line in the call of duty. Carry out your mission and keep your honor clean. Witness a high-tech, high-speed war unlike any other in 
21 days to Baghdad. shock and awe. 48 hours of the most massive precision bombing campaign in the history of warfare. 700 aircraft, hundreds of cruise missiles, 3,000 precision guided bombs. All deadly accurate, all focused on stunning the Iraqi regime and breaking its will to fight. But the inside story of shock and awe involves far more than the explosions that rocked Baghdad. It involves an unprecedented and untested war plan. One that sought to destroy a regime without killing large numbers of civilians. One week after 9-11, an FBI special agent interviews a prisoner in a New York City jail. I walked in and I sat down with him and I said, well, let's tell me how they did it. Immediately after the terrorist attacks, authorities placed the prisoner in 24-hour lockdown. For a week, he's been in total isolation with no access to TV, radio, or newspapers. You know, what he laid out was the attack as if he knew every detail of it. This is how you position yourself. I taught people how to sit in first class. I told you about utility knives. It was just kind of eerie. The prisoner is this man. My name is Ali Mohammed. He was Osama bin Laden's spy in America. He worked for and betrayed three arms of the US government, the CIA, the US Army, and the FBI an extraordinary triple cross. He paved the way for Al-Qaeda in the United States. Islam without political domination cannot survive. He helped bin Laden build the global terror network we know today. How did US authorities fail to connect the dots? How did he pull it off? And where is he now? <laughs> 